Hello. Hopefully you can all hear me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today and talking to you all. And I've been taught today, asked to talk today about the topic of which skills are necessary as the mining industry moves into the next few decades, as we find all of the raw materials for this energy transition, what are the skills that are going to be really crucial to geoscientists? And it's a big topic because, as I'm sure we are all aware, there's a lot of changes coming over the next few decades for the mining industry. Um, but I think proactively thinking about where that industry is going to go, the scale of what the industry has to achieve means that actually we can try and prepare ourselves and make sure that we are encouraging people with diverse skill sets into the industry and training up people who are already within the industry to be able to meet this challenge in the most responsible way possible. So to start with, I've only got 20 minutes today and I'm going to stick to that 20 minutes. Um, I want to set the scene initially, you know, what is the scale of this energy transition? What, how big a task do we actually have in front of us? And then I'm going to talk through the skills that I think are going to be really key over the next few decades to make sure that we are extracting these raw materials as responsibly as possible. You know, if we want to find the raw materials to allow us to facilitate the energy transition because we want to combat climate change, then it's more important than ever to make sure we're extracting these materials as responsibly as possible. So you will probably hear the word responsible quite a lot over the next 20 minutes. And then I'm going to look at the work that the company I actually work for in the UK, a company called Cornish Lithium. I'm going to look at the work that we're doing as an example as to how industry can embrace new technologies, whether that's for exploration, whether that's for extraction, of critical raw materials as well and then finally bring it all together so in 20 minutes we've got a fair amount to cover but hopefully it will all happen seamlessly so just to set the scene then a quote that I'm sure we all know everything that we use in our daily life has been extracted from the ground in one way or another it's been grown or it's been mined and minerals and metals have been vital to human existence for thousands and thousands of years um, and ultimately they all come from the earth's crust People are now talking about the fourth industrial revolution, and I think especially in light of the COP26 conference, which has just finished, and I think people have mixed opinions on quite how successful that has been. However, it shows that the energy transition is so vital if we want to combat climate change. We need to move away from our oil and gas, fossil fuel-based economies towards renewable energies, and we need wind turbines, we need solar panels, we need batteries to store this renewable energy at a grid scale, we need electric vehicles instead of combustion engine vehicles. And this is all hugely mineral intensive, this transition to low carbon. We're seeing an unprecedented scale and speed that these novel technologies are being deployed at. Um, but if you take into account that these are hugely mineral intensive, and we've got global supply chains for all of the building blocks of these low carbon technologies, then at some point, there may well be some bottlenecks we see in these global supply chains, whether that's from the fact that we can't produce things fast enough, or if we start to take into account geopolitics and where some of these critical raw materials are found. So the energy transition is going to be hugely mineral intensive. There's a fantastic report that was out from the International Energy Agency earlier this year called The Role of Critical Minerals in the Clean Energy Transition. And it's got some mind boggling statistics in it. So I totally recommend going to read that if you've got a moment. Um, one of those statistics is that they expect global renewable capacity to grow by over one terawatt from 2018 to 2023. That's just five years and a 46% increase in that time. An onshore wind plant requires nine times more mineral resources than a gas-fired power plant to produce the same amount of energy. You require six times the mineral inputs to make an electric car than you do for a conventional car. And actually, because the proportion of renewables generating our power these days is increasing, it actually means that the average amount of minerals needed to generate a unit of power has risen by 50% since 2010 as well. So that's all well and good. And actually, if we want to talk about combating climate change, then actually, if we want to reach the goals of the Paris Agreement, so keep 
global warming to less than two degrees above what it was before pre-industrial levels, then actually we need to quadruple the mineral requirements for clean energy technologies by 2040. If we want to transition to net zero globally even faster than that, we need to be extracting six times more minerals by 2040 than we're extracting at the moment. So if you consider that on average in the mining industry, it takes about 16 years from finding a mineral deposit to actually producing from it, then the industry's got a huge task ahead of it. And then finally, there's a lot of geopolitics associated with where these minerals and metals are being produced. And in certain parts of the world, such as Northern Europe, there's not actually that much mineral production. That isn't necessarily because we've got an absence of mineral deposits, rather the knowledge about the availability of them isn't there. Europe, Northern Europe and North America have been quite good at outsourcing our mineral production over the last couple of decades. Um, people don't want to mine in their backyard quite often, this not in my backyard, NIMBY attitude. And so there can be a negative perception of the mining industry as well that we need to tackle proactively and, you know, see what happens. So that's all very well and good, but where on earth are we going to find these raw materials? And that's where I think a huge opportunity lies, exploration. We can ask the question about whether the easy stuff has been found. And actually, there's an argument that we need to start to look deeper undercover. We need to be looking in more remote areas of the world. We need to look for deposits that are lower grade. Um, we need to be able to mine more selectively and extract things more efficiently. So new technologies are going to be so important in this, whether it's satellite imagery and things that help us vector in on mineral deposits on a large scale, or whether it's geophysical techniques and data modeling techniques that allow us to actually visualize what's under the subsurface at deeper and deeper depths. Perversely, we may also need to look closer to home. In the UK, for example, we're now looking to see which mineral resources we have that might be critical to the energy transition, such as lithium and tin in Cornwall. But this also means we proactively need to deal with this not in my backyard attitude. The circular economy is going to become increasingly important. And this is a difficult one because the whole concept of a circular economy is that you eventually design out waste, but obviously, to design out any waste, it means that we need to be stopping any primary inputs. But as populations grow around the world and as technologies change around the world, change and develop, it means that we simply can't recycle everything that's currently in production to meet those future demands because some of those resources just aren't in production already, aren't in circulation in high enough quantities. So I think it's fair and realistic to say that primary resource production is going to be a key input to the circular economy for the next few years. However, there are huge opportunities within the circular economy. And I think if, as an industry, we can apply circular economy thinking and design from the onset of the concept of a mining project, then there's a huge opportunity here. In exploration, we can embrace technologies to help us explore things more efficiently. Uh, when it comes to actually extracting these raw materials, again, Embracing new technologies means we can minimize waste as far as possible. Um, you know, if you've got a copper mine that's producing copper at 1%, which is a fairly high grade for a copper mine now, actually that's still 99% of what you're producing is waste. So can we look at this waste in a different way? Can we form aggregates from it? Are there other materials that we can extract from this waste? Can we use this waste to, you know, can it have an actual economic purpose? Um, also, thinking about waste is historic waste. So for the mining industry 20, 30, 50 years ago, when head grains were much higher, that historic mining waste could now be a potential resource as well. So we need to look at ways of reprocessing existing waste, for example. There's also the urban mine. There's lots of mobile phones, technology that's sitting around unused in people's cupboards and drawers. How can we make the most of that? How can we turn these into usable products? And then once we've actually produced our mineral ores, can we think more smartly about refining them into usable products for industry? So if we take lithium, for example, rather than just producing a lithium carbonate concentrate on site, actually, with not too much more effort, we can potentially produce a lithium hydroxide battery quality product that then is much more appealing to people who are setting up battery mega factories as a precursor for them to use in battery assembling. So we can potentially think about how we can shorten these supply chains by a little bit more effort on site. Um, 
And then recycling is going to be so important as well. Can we apply extraction technology from primary extraction to actually extracting the metals from their end of life products? Can we combine primary production and use you know lithium from recycled batteries as a feedstock alongside that somewhere in the process so there's huge opportunities within the circular economy esg stands for environment social and governance and this is becoming so much more important across the mining industry as it rightly should um, so an understanding of this is vital but actually we also need people who can demonstrate the ESG credentials of a project how can we actually how can we actually measure tangible things that can tell us how environmentally responsible how socially responsible a project actually is are we just going to value projects still on the economics of the you know the quantity of metal within the ground and the price it's going to cost to extract it or are we actually going to look at what the social and environmental impacts of these projects are as well and give that a value i think that's going to become more and more and more important actually we've seen even over just the last two years investors are now focusing so much more highly on the esg performance of companies they don't want to invest in a company that's going to have an environmental disaster or hasn't got a social license to operate because that's going to be really bad from their point of view so cynically from an industry point of view you've got to be demonstrating your esg credentials so that you can actually get investment and demonstrate your products but you know if we're extracting these materials because we want to help the energy transition and combat climate change, then actually it's so important to make sure we're extracting them as responsibly as possible. Um, and so scrutiny on mining companies and supply chains is only going to increase. This is, in my opinion, only a good thing for the industry. And one tool to let us understand the actual impacts of a project, at the moment it's very much only the environmental impacts of a project rather than the social impacts, but I think people are looking to develop life cycle assessment tools that can let you look at the social side of things as well um, life cycle assessments are really key so on the right here i've just got a example from a life cycle assessment that was done comparing lithium production from different sources and what's the carbon impacts of producing lithium in that way so the tons of carbon dioxide associated with a ton of lithium hydroxide production and you can see that from hard rock spodumene deposits such as those that you find in west australia you know, it can have quite a significant carbon impact from salar type brine deposits that you get in South America, then actually the carbon impact of producing lithium from those is much lower. But actually, if you can produce lithium from geothermal waters, from geothermal brines, then there's actually the opportunity for it to be net zero carbon. So you can use these life cycle assessments as a tool to, from an early stage in a project, map out the different potential development routes for your project and say, oh, if we choose that way, we're going to have a higher carbon impact, but actually our water use is going to be much lower. Or if we do things that way, then actually, although our carbon impact is low, we're also having a huge impact on land use. So it allows you to compare like with like, and it's a really interesting tool and it's becoming used much more widely within the industry. And there's a company called Minviro who are really leading the charge on this. But it's not just the environmental impacts of things as well. The social impacts of the mining industry are really important. If mining and mineral extraction is done responsibly, then it has the opportunity to contribute in a positive way to all 17 sustainable development goals. Um, but responsible really is key. So different projects in different parts of the world will be able to contribute in different proportions to all of these goals. But I think it's something that as we move forward as an industry, we really need to be aware of. And actually people who can understand this and translate it and ensure that at every step we're keeping these goals in mind, that's only going to be a positive thing as well. And then over the last few years, there's been a huge proliferation in data science. Big data represents huge opportunities for exploration, for mineral production, for mine production. Um, it can allow you to automate things throughout a mine cycle. If something breaks down, it can automatically order a new part. Um, you know, I haven't got time to go into this in too much detail here, but I think the oil and gas industry have been a lot better at embracing big data. In the UK, the Oil and Gas Authority after i think two years after the data has been generated by a company it has to be given to the oil and gas authority and made public so they've got these huge vast data sets that actually can be really key in helping you gather enough data to do 
machine learning and start to you know generate targets for exploration and learn things um, I think the mining industry has got a long way to go at the moment for this because a lot of the data is kind of privately held and it's RIP. So there's a long way to go in the industry for that. But there are projects such as the Deep Digital Cornwall project here in the UK, um, which is looking at using big data machine learning to actually help the minerals industry and the geothermal industry down in Cornwall. So these are kind of technical skills, but actually interpersonal skills, we can't underestimate the importance of those. And we can't underestimate the importance of encouraging a more diverse set of people into the mining industry. There's a definition of insanity, which is expecting different results, yet doing the same thing over and over again. If we don't change what we're doing, how are we going to be able to meet the challenges of this energy transition? in the most fair and just way possible. You know, there's a huge variety of really exciting careers in geoscience, but in the UK and I think in Northern Europe, we need to attract more students into the sector. At the moment, I think the mining industry is seen as environmentally negative, whereas actually it, we, can't, we can't have this energy transition without it. We need to change the narrative about it and portray the minerals industry as actually an environmentally necessary way. So it's a necessary industry for us to have if we want to deliver this energy transition. But also, I think a lot of people have the perception of geoscience in particular, that it's walking around with a rock hammer, bashing rocks, whereas actually it isn't just field work. Yes, some of us absolutely love that part of things, but equally it's not for everybody. There's actually now a huge range of roles that you can do that are computer-based that allow you to work remotely. You can work all across the globe in the mining industry. And I think people who are ready to embrace that would be fantastic. Communication is so important. Um, if we can't increase public perception of the industry and increase engagement with it, then all of our jobs are going to be so much harder. But that's external engagement. But you also need internal engagement. You need to be able to talk and understand to your data scientists what they're doing. You don't need to understand all the nitty gritty of the work that they've done. But if everybody can communicate the high level goals and outcomes and everybody's working towards the same strategic outcomes, then actually that's so important. I also want to highlight the importance of role models here. And again, coming back to this, this idea about diversity, you need diverse thought if you want to be able to meet challenges in the most efficient way possible. That means you need people who are from all different backgrounds, different races, different genders, and role models are really important in that. There's a phrase that you can't be what you can't see. If there's nobody ahead of you that looks like you or has a similar background to you, then it's much harder for you to actually visualize yourself in that position. So I think as an industry, we need to proactively promote people from diverse backgrounds. Obviously, they've got to be good, they've got to be the right people, but we need to actually make an effort to do that. It's not just gonna happen quickly enough otherwise. And so this is where groups such as the Young Mining Professionals and Women in Mining are fantastic at helping to promote diversity. Now, I've only got a couple of minutes left, so I had put what Cornish Lithium are doing as a kind of case study, and I can go into this in more detail later, but I'm going to flick through this very quickly because I think I've got two minutes left. So talk to me afterwards if you want me to go into it in more depth. Basically, we're looking for lithium in Cornwall. This is granite that outcrops. The granite is hot. So that's where there's also the potential for geothermal energy. And you've got lots of mineralized structures. We can embrace technology to allow us to explore more efficiently. There's thousands of years of mining data, in, well, thousands of years of history of mining in Cornwall, and lots and lots of paper records. So we can use technology such as LeapFrog to digitally trace over these mining records, we can turn them into 3D digital models of the geology, the mineralization and the structures. We can use satellite data. This is a radiometric survey of Cornwall. You can see that the granites really are these bright hotspots. We can use drones to capture 3D photogrammetry and build 3D virtual models of outcrops that are interesting. And then you can, because you've georeferenced them, you can do virtual reality field work. Um, we're looking at using new extraction technologies to extract lithium, both from the granite itself, from mica deposits, um, and also to extract lithium from geothermal waters as well. Without the advent of these new technologies, these projects wouldn't be viable. And actually, even five years ago, they probably wouldn't have been economically viable. But technology has improved so rapidly 
and actually that means that these projects are looking like actual exciting viable projects now so looking forward we need to transition away from our fossil fuel based economy if we want to decarbonize and combat climate change. So georesources are crucial in this energy transition. And as geoscientists, I really believe that we have to act as responsible stewards of these resources. Stewardship is a really important word to me. We have the skill set to understand where to find these raw materials. We have the skill sets to understand how to extract them. But actually, we need to collaborate with other industries to understand how we can do that better, how we can do it more efficiently, what we can learn from these industries that have potentially been embracing these big data approaches in the past. Um, we need to be open to embracing new technologies. We need to be able to communicate really well. And we need to promote diversity within the industry as well. So to sum up, collaboration is vital. We've got a long way to go, and I think it's a really exciting time to be a geoscientist. So thank you very much.